This conference will now be recorded. Mike just dismissed him. Did you write that? Good afternoon. I will call the Park and Recreation Advisory Board uh, into session. First thing on our agenda is to um, have roll call. Coiner? Uh, Here. The father? Here. Yeah. McBride? Here. Meyer? Ortiz? Here. Peterson? Here. <laughs> Shirts? He is here. He's here. Yeah. Uh, Leah Stratt? And Jody? Here. Yeah. I will report that we do have a form so we can uh, proceed with our agenda for this afternoon. Uh, first on our agenda is approval of the October 21st minutes. Do I have, I'll give you just a moment and then I will entertain a motion to approve. First and a second. So. Do I hear a motion for approval? I make a motion to approve the minutes. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, those approving the minutes as, approved, as, as presented indicate with yes. Yes. Opposed? Yes. No. Uh, yeah, we had a delay. Krista, you, you approve, correct? Correct, I approve. Thank you, thank you. That motion has been passed, so we have the October 21st minutes in a record. <laughs> uh, do we have Sorry. a contest? Contest. Anyone here? Yes. Yes, today. We do have comments. Uh, thank you. Uh, no public comment at this time. Um, old business, there is none. So we're on to the real important part of this meeting, and that is to uh, have a presentation on the parks master plan, and Chad will do introductions. And there, our speaker is on the chair for everybody who's here, so if we speak up, it will be recorded. The meeting is recorded, but not video. All right, thank you everyone. So today we have Patrick Alford with our consultant team, Confluence, to give us an update on the progress of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Uh, just a little background, we kicked this project off, oh, summer of 2020, sort of-ish, fall-ish, fall. yeah. Um, so it's been a little over a year, it's been a long process, um, we've had some delays due to just everything's slower now, just with the pandemic and everything. So, but we are nearing the finish line. We're excited to have Patrick here to give an overview of where we're at with the plan. Uh, this is just a presentation. We're not looking for any action. Um, so following this meeting, I will actually probably next week or the week after send you the actual full document to review on your own leisure time and I'm sure gather lots of questions. Um, and then at our December meeting, Patrick will be back to formally answer questions and, and discuss the plan. Uh, certainly, we'll take questions today as well, or comments or any feedback that you have. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Patrick and, and let him walk you through his presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to start off by saying thanks for the opportunity to share this update this evening. I apologize that it's not a full presentation of the completed plan, but as Chad has said, we've experienced some delays. 
I take full responsibility for that. Um, we are nearing the end, but we're not there yet. There is still work to be done. So the, the plan this afternoon is to kind of give you an overview of the document, to kind of talk a little bit about the general findings that we've uh, we've had, and some basic a basic overview of recommendations from a facilities perspective, um, and then uh, we will follow up with the completed document in a couple of weeks. Um, I have two PDFs. Uh, one is this presentation, which I will kind of go through, um, but there are elements in the full document as it sits currently that I'll need to switch to at some point. So um, we will try to do that as uh, elegantly as possible. All right. So uh, we'll do a plan overview, talk a little bit about comments and themes. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about level of service. Uh, apropos, considering at your last meeting, Chad went through kind of parks classifications um, as the NRPA has them. Uh, recommendations overview, then we'll talk just a little bit about next steps. So what you'll see on the screen or what you do see on the screen is the, the document itself. Um, so you're going to get a sense of what the look and feel of it is here from a couple of pages. And then when we switch over to the other one, we'll give you a, a little better idea of, of where we're at. Um, the way that the document is organized is really into five primary chapters. Um, our introduction and planning framework in chapter one, where we, we talk about the introduction and the purpose of the plan. Um, we reiterate the mission, vision, and values of the department. Um, and you may recall that when we kicked this project off, we talked a lot to staff about whether or not we wanted to revisit the mission, vision, and values of the department as a component of this plan, which is something that we routinely do. Um, and the consensus was no. So the current mission, vision, and values as established by the Parks and Recreation is what um, is guiding the plan and included in the document. Um, chapter one also kind of outlines approach, a process, and provides an executive summary uh, of, the, of the plan itself. In chapter two, um, we highlight the, our community engagement process. Uh, we're summarizing our general comments and themes, as we've heard from the public input and engagement uh, exercises that we've had and then providing overviews of sort of our, our primary and key findings with a lot of the detailed information, particularly that information um, that was compiled and completed by PROS Consulting um, will be uh, in the appendix at the back of the document. Um, but we are providing those summaries so that they're sort of ready uh, and, at, uh, and at the ease of finding from anybody who picks the document up or goes to the online version of it um, to be able to read. In chapter three, we're outlining the recommendations, uh, major themes, there's facility recommendations and then the program recommendations. It's an overview, kind of a summary of the program ass assessment. But in chapter four, um, we, we bring the recreation program assessment that was completed by PROS into the forefront of the document and really kind of outline in detail um, what their findings were, uh, develop the funding and revenue strategies. And then chapter five is the 10 year phased implementation plan. This is that important matrix where we've identified improvements um, and, and program program and facility improvements uh, over the 10 year period and that opportunity to go and look at them. These last two chapters, chapter four and chapter five are the ones that we haven't quite finished yet, but we've still got some updates to complete in chapter three, but by and large, the, the front half of the document is complete and we're working to get the rest of this information in um, and at a point where we can hand it to you for review. In the appendix, we have our park condition assessments. Um, I'll show you a few of those here in a little bit. Uh, the demographic and trends analysis, the benchmark comparison that was completed by PROS. The program assessment was originally an appendix item, but that's been moved up because I think the information that's in there needs to be in the front of the document. Um, we completed a golf course study as a component of this project as well. That's in the appendix. And then the River's Edge sports complex um, study is in there as well. So some general comments and themes. Um, again, look and feel of the document. Um, I'll go through a couple of these. I can let you read them, but I'll read them myself. Um, second sheet of ice was a common uh, was, a, was a common comment uh, in all of the public input that we had. Uh, a lot of people talking about the need for that second ice sheet at River's Edge to facilitate more programs, hockey, other skating programs, etc. Um, maintenance in general across the system was a very common theme um, that a lot of the input said, we need to maintain our parks better. We need to commit more resources to maintaining parks across the system. This one uh, was more direct in saying that a lot of people they know go to Bettendorf to use the dog park there as opposed to going to Marquette. 
Um, I take this one a little personally because Confluence was the designer at the market back <laughs> a couple of years ago before before I became principal. So, um, but it got completed under my watch, and so you know this one I, I put in there for that reason. Um, but you know, not an uncommon theme in, in what we were hearing from the public input. Um, another one, and I'll summarize these in a moment, was that uh, more new parks are needed. And, and one of the things that, that we found as we looked across the system was, while in terms of total acreage, and I'll get into this a little bit farther when I talk about little level of service, in terms of total acreage, the park system's doing really, really well. You're, you're exceeding your sort of benchmark acreages per capita for similar sized cities with similar sized programs. But where we're lacking is in neighborhood parks in particular. Those being those ones that have a half mile rate walking radius or walking distance from them um, and provide neighborhood level services throughout the community. We've got a lot of overlap with our community parks in certain areas of town. I'm gonna to show you the level of service maps, you'll understand. Um, but that is the most common theme uh, across all of the public comment was the need for more neighborhood scale parks with uh, a variety of amenities. And always a feel good at the end. You guys are doing a great job. Parks and Recreation is doing a great job. There was a handful of comments about that. Uh, so generally, uh, our take on that is public perception of the department is excellent, uh, but there's a recognition that there are still deficiencies and there are needs that, that ought to be addressed by the department. Any questions on those comments? Okay. So here are themes, more ice, better maintenance, new parks, new trails. We'll touch on that. Um, another very common theme, uh, in, in the input that we received was we've got a great east-west trail system that connects the like, Duck Creek Corridor Trail, connects east-west town, but what we're really missing are safe connections north to south that connect those trails together. Mm -hmm. So as a, as a part of our plan, we've actually looked very extensively at where those opportunities exist within the community and how we might provide those connections over the long term uh, that are safe off-street, aren't requiring families with children to ride bikes on the roads to make that more south connection. And then the last one, um, this one always seems to come up no matter where we were, we want more, more lighting on trails. It's also one of the more difficult ones to accomplish. That level of infrastructure introduces typically a lot of other issues that most departments aren't prepared to address, uh, not the least of which is safety along trails. So when you introduce lighting, you introduce use after hours, which also introduces opportunity for unsafe conditions for those users. So we've got to be really careful in how you address lighting system-wide. Generally speaking, we add lighting where we have an urban park that has got regular um, access by uh, safety services that you can provide a little longer use during the day, but trail corridors in particular are not the best location for that typically. Um, users who are going to use trails for commuting, um, generally provide their own lights and generally do a good job with it. So, you know, there's a trade-off in, um, in what part of the population you're serving when you do add lighting. <clears throat> All right, we'll talk a little bit about level of service. The information that you see here on the screen, I don't know if my page works. Um, all of this, neighborhood parks, community parks, regional parks, regional aquatic centers. The one thing that was in the October 21st notes that I don't have on here was mini parks, um, but the, the size acreage, Walking distance and radius are all the same pretty consistently across the board, so you're pretty familiar with that. Um, I assume that we talked about um, that it's classifications as a way of, of sort of designating the size, scale, amenity of the park um, and the type of service that that provides without the community. NRPA uses these classifications as a guideline. It used to be a metric where each community was compared to the next based on that service radius, the number of those parks, the acreage served. But what we've learned over time is that no two communities are the same, right? So having a consistent metric from Davenport to Des Moines to Waterloo isn't necessarily apples to apples kind of comparison. So now the way that NRPA looks at benchmarking systems is you use these classifications as a way of evaluating where you're at identifying some perhaps core deficiencies, but then we look to the department to assess whether or not those services are being met otherwise in the community. So oftentimes, and especially in a community like Davenport where you have private service providers, there may be services that Parks and Recreation is not providing or not meeting that baseline metric on, 
but that are, the community is getting satisfied through some of these other providers. Common YMCA, um, private sports facilities where they might have adult and rec leagues, uh, those sorts of entities tend to fill gaps in the system where, um, say for example here, where we have um, a deficiency by the metric in the number of adult ball fields, those services are being fulfilled by other entities. Does that make sense? Okay. So we go ahead and look at all of the acreage in town, and this is not going to be the clearest, and I'm going to try to read it from one side or the other. Um, across the top, you have your park types, regional community, neighborhood parks. We calculate all of the acreage. Um, we also look at what Scott County is providing, because it's a similar provider, you know, constituent agency. Um, we look at the total inventory. And then using the NRP guidelines of eight acres per 1,000, we determine if the system is meeting the needs of the community. So when you have an opportunity to look this, and I apologize for the lack of clarity here, um, but when you have the opportunity to look down through this, what you'll see is we're meeting or exceeding the standard for regional and community parks. We are not quite meeting standard on neighborhood parks, but exceeding it in total park area. Okay, so that's where that recommendation for more neighborhood parks comes to play. Not meeting sort of the minimum standard as NRPA looks at it. And if you were to ask anybody, would it, is it more important to have, to meet the standard in community parks, regional parks versus neighborhood parks, general consensus is gonna be neighborhood parks are your most important parks in the system because they're the ones that are serving the people that have limited mobility or access. Um, there are those neighborhood facilities where kids can get together, people can socialize, and you can do it conveniently and easily. Some other things that we found, um, we've got, we looked at shelters uh, in terms of size, small, medium, and large. We've got plenty of large or plenty of small shelters. We need a few more medium-sized shelters. Um, we looked at multi-purpose fields. Uh, we looked at for youth and adult and found that we need a few more of those system-wide. But you know, that sort of thing is one of those one of those amenities that we're looking to those other service providers to determine if if the department really needs to provide more of those or if that need is being satisfied within the community. Ultimately, the determination in a 10-year plan to provide more adult fields or youth multi-purpose fields is going to be based on what, what staff knows and what we understand the system to be functioning. So if programming um, is exceeding the need for more fields, then we're probably not going to add more fields into the system. Um, we also looked at basketball, tennis, a um, couple others here, paved trails and outdoor pools. So paved trails, I think, is one of the important ones because it was a theme in our comment. Um, we look at off-street trails. We don't calculate on-street trail mileage as a part of the park system. So when you see on our plan here that for the current population, we would need an additional eight miles of off-street trail. That escalates to 10 miles of off-street trail for the next census cycle, which was 2030. Um, that is a clear deficiency and something that needs to be addressed in the system to provide um, those trail miles and most importantly, to create that connectivity in the system that allows people to have a more consistent riding and multi-use uh, multi trail experience. Any questions on that? In general so here's what it looks like graphically <laughs> so on the left are our neighborhood parks you can see there's a, a real concentration of neighborhood sized parks in the older part of the community where there tends to be far fewer uh, to the north um, and you can see in the northeast northwest and really the whole of the south uh, southwest part of town there's a lack of neighborhood parks now there's some topography issues up there, there's a lack of development in some of those places. So when you look at it, you can't look at it exclusively as we need to have full coverage of neighborhood parks across the entire city limits. We do take into consideration those other barriers or other um, development um, conditions that would, would dictate not having a park in those areas. Then we add in our community parks. And so this circle here represents that half mile radius for neighborhood park. Um, the larger circle here is a two mile radius around our community parks. And again, you can kind of see the distribution of these in the community. Um, and then once we move forward to the last, this is an overlap drawing. The big circles are our 10 mile radius for our regional parks. Um, we have plenty of those and we've got more coming. So as you think about riverfront park development, those are all going to be considered as sort of regional destination 
or special use park. Um, so we'll have more than adequate coverage there. Um, and even with that, just looking strictly at community and neighborhood parks, you can see there are areas of town that if development occurs and continues to pressure in those areas, there'll be a greater need. The area that we're looking at where we see probably the most desire for neighborhood parks is kind of in here where we don't have overlap um, on the neighborhood parks within the system, but we do have coverage from the community parks. There are areas in here where we know we have dense established neighborhoods that don't have parks nearby. Okay. All right. Back over here. So some major themes. Um, connection and access. So providing high quality uh, or access to high quality park facilities throughout the city. Uh, programming, so a variety of high quality programs and services, you guys are doing really well there. Sustainability is a common theme. It's one that we're always going to look at, especially now as we are all considering the impact of climate change. Um, you know, this is to identify, protect, and celebrate natural areas and resources throughout the city, introduce sustainable management practices, which is a comment that we heard um, in a lot of our input. Health and safety as a theme, so promoting health and wellness uh, throughout the community, providing equitable access to facilities and services is really important. Um, and then one uh, that we find commonly is this, this need to establish a visual identity, a brand for the park system. And we can talk a little bit about that happens. So we provide some basic, um, some basic recommendations, kind of overview level stuff. And then as we move forward, we've got specific recommendations for improvements in the park facilities. We'll have similar ones that will show up um, here in the document for the programs as well. Um, but Overall, our general recommendations for facilities uh, clearly focus on neighborhood parks, uh, invest in those trails and trail connections, particularly the north-south connections, um, indoor recreation and community facilities. We know there's need for more indoor community and recreation space. That needs to be a focus over the next few years is um, identifying how a new facility can be constructed or multiple. Um, commit to consistent and improved maintenance uh, across the system create a consistent identity and brand for Davenport Parks and Recreation that's readily identifiable and visually attractive. Um, a lot of times that starts with park signage and you look across our signage or your signage currently within the system, there is a general aesthetic consistency to it, but there's variability from one to the next. The recommendation is if you want for some, if you want a visitor within the community to know clearly that a property or a park is Davenport Parks and Recreation, that brand begins with the signage and then it is um, it is substantiated throughout the park by a consistency in color, material, uh, architecture, those sorts of things go a long way towards establishing that brand. Oh, I'm a little too far. And then incorporate and expand our natural resource opportunities wherever possible. Um, one of the things that we heard in discussions or in comments on trails in general was there was an equal desire for paved off-street trails and hiking soft surface trails within some of the natural areas within the system. And we know that that is occurring, that development is occurring in those areas, um, but it is something that uh, the community is asking for as well. And it's clear. I won't go through all of these, but we've gone through and looked at all of the park properties and done assessments of those properties. And I'll show you in a minute what those look like. And as a result of those assessments, we developed a series of recommendations specific to those parks. Not every single park will be addressed with a recommendation um, because we have to phase, we have to prioritize these out over 10 years. Um, but by and large, everything that we looked at, there's room for opportunity. We identified what we thought was viable um, in terms of a 10-year plan, and we'll be finalizing this and updating this as we, as we wrap the document. But you can see that we've gone through and looked at looked at quite a few. Okay, so I would like to switch to the other document if I could, please. Okay, thank you. All right, so right now the document's sitting at a bit over 400 pages. I don't want to scare anybody by that um, because a lot of it is the appendix, right? The, the the main piece of the document would be far shorter than that, probably less than 100 pages when we're all said. So it's not going to be this huge tome that you can't get through. Okay. 
what we've found as a result of our experience is that the more information that we can plug into the inventory and assessment pieces of this, the, the better it is for anybody that reads it to kind of understand what we have and what we need. And I'm gonna do my best to slide through this. Um, there's a lot of stuff in here. The department provided us with photos that have all populated the document. Um, but we've got these inventory and assessment sheets. And so this is just one example of what they look like for each part. So for each part we went out, we had uh, personnel in the field, looking at the park, taking photographs, inventorying the different amenities that were in the park, and then providing um, the qualitative but objective analysis of the condition of those elements, and then also identifying opportunities kind of in the field as they were looking. We've created an inventory sheet for each of these. Some of them have multiple. In fact, all of them have multiple sheets. Um, and um, I'm going to have to go all the way to the back and see if I can get there quickly. I'm sorry. Hopefully, this doesn't. All right. Can I see the. Oh, that's not good. Maybe. Hopefully I'll download it. All right, so each park starts off with the page, photos. You can see that we've got some indication of uh, the park usage, what the public access is like, whether or not there's parking. In general, we provide acreage and size, its classification, the ward that it's in, uh, provide a little bit of context where we could find it. We put park history in. Okay, so it's extremely comprehensive. Uh, there's potential improvements uh, as an opportunity listed. Not all of them are included on the inventory and analysis. Uh, we also identified what the seasonal or if there were seasonal amenities, what seasons uh, those amenities could be used. Uh, we also provide that inventory of amenities, the quantity of them, and then a condition assessment that's either good, fair, or poor. So this is this great resource to go back to and go, oh, those are, you know, okay, there's poor stuff there. We need to identify that as something to be replaced. And then we provide photographic uh, inventory of all of those elements as well. You will see that as you look through the inventory sheets, just how much of a variety of shelter types, trash can types, bench types, equipment types there are across the system. And looking at those side by side, you could, if you took the park sign that says Davenport Parks and Recreation Way, Looking at them, there's no way that you would know that these were all within the same park system because there's so much differentiation between them. And that's where you know, we come back to that visual identity and brand um, to really establish this sort of community feel um, and the importance of parks within the community that we want to sort of work towards that. It's not something that you can do overnight, but it's something that as you systematically upgrade and improve, you can develop consistent standards for those elements, and then over time, you've substantiated the brand. The other thing that we did, you'll recall we did a lot of our public input uh, on Social Pinpoint, and we gave people the opportunity to drop pins on the map and make comments and tell us about the park. So unlike other plans that we've done, this is one of the first ones where we've included all of the public comment that we received for each part from Social Pinpoint as a part of the inventory analysis. So each one of these has this plan map from uh, from Social Pinpoint, as well as the different comments that were dropped in here, and then a summary of what those comments were with each park. And when, when possible, and I don't know if this one has it, but in a lot of cases we had public comment that said, we'd love to see an improvement here, we'd love to see this here. Those are included on the inventory sheet as well. So any facility that received comment um, from the Social Pinpoint site, and most did, have that included as a part of the inventory sheet. A really nice record of, of what all of that is. And they go on and on and on. Right? I can flash through a bunch of them, but I don't want anybody to have a seizure. So that gets us quite a way through, Doc. You can see just the number of pages that the inventory takes up. And then when we get to the appendix, um, there's Quite a bit more to look at. Now the other pages that I wanted to kind of go to were these trail system pages. 
talk a little bit about that. These were put back in the inventory because that's where they started, um, but they will move forward into the final iteration of the document. I'm going to stand back here so I can look at the map too. Um, but so we inventoried the existing system of trails and then started to look at where new opportunities existed and kind of looked uh, strategically at the map of the city and the city limits, looking for opportunities in drainage areas, looking for opportunities um, in open space to add trail connections. It doesn't read well from this distance um, in terms of the color, but when you look at it up close, it's color coded. Um, potential trails or trail improvement opportunities are identified and color coded on the plan. Um, and then we've calculated what that total number of miles is um, throughout the system for the future. Uh, and we'll be making a recommendation for how many trail miles can be constructed you know, over the next 10 years, provided other factors fall into place. But we looked at all four quadrants of the city and made those recommendations. This, in my opinion, is one of the really important components of this plan. Um, Chad aptly pointed out the other day that we need to make sure that this is coordinated with Go Davenport, that there's not um, contradicting information. We'll make sure that happens. Um, but I wanted to share with you that, that this is in here and um, we'll move forward in the document. All right, I'm going to come back to that last slide. Are there any questions? I have a question. Please. <laughs> Sorry, dear. On the trails, did you look at railroad lines that are no longer being used to expand a bike path or a trail of some sort? I did not specifically look at that. I would have to ask Ben, the landscape architect in my office, who did the trail analysis, whether or not he looked at that specifically. I would assume that he did, but I can't say with confidence that that's the case. And if not, We'll look at it for sure. If you have specific ideas. Well, because I know up in Des Moines, they did a huge yep. expansion. And I, off the top of my head, I want to say rails to trails that there's a big group and they have financial yep. capabilities potentially that we could tap into. Um, I don't know. I know in the West End, there's one railroad line that is no longer being used because they took the bridge and stuff out. but. I don't know as far as the rest of the Davenport. I, I think there's been conversations in the past, and I think a lot of it's been that with the existence by the railroad company, the lot of the city utilize their expenses or they still own those railroads. Yeah. That's at least some feedback I've heard. But it, you're right. I mean, that's a common practice in yeah. trail development to use abandoned railroads uh, lines to, right. to do that. But um, we have, I guess I would say, a tumultuous relationship with the Canadian Pacific at this time. Yeah. So, uh, but yes, that's yeah. definitely an opportunity that the folks need to look at. Yeah. And I would say that historically speaking, railroads are very difficult to work with. Um, where rails to trails projects have been successful um, have been largely the result of intense public desire and pressure to do so and an advocating agency like rails to trails that was queued up and really knew how to to make it happen and you're absolutely right des moines and ankeny and all of central iowa was really capitalized on yeah. on the sort of abandoning of those rail lines to make those trail connections the one thing they were lucky about is the rails to trails movement came as those railroads abandoned right I've got a map here. There were once railroads out through Eldridge, which have an unbelievable system. However, those were abandoned and were farmed 50 years ago. So they're no longer. And so that Des Moines area is so lucky because that all happened. It's a great we, point. Yes, we could have a beautiful system. Oh, uh, unbelievable. But it was all done 50 years ago before there was ever rail to trail. Ankeny and Des Moines was? No, he's in here. Ours were oh, torn out. Oh, yeah, okay. what, what we've got left is mostly in use, other than that one that goes yeah. across Rocky. You know, I mean, there's not a lot of abandoned yeah. red lines. No, yeah. They've all been plowed up. And gotcha. Surprisingly, the ones for us, I was amazed. Mm -hmm. What about county? I'm sorry, what about county? County parks or? Yeah. And then your trails and so forth go out through the county parks and so forth. They, they do. All part of it? It's all it's, it's all looked at. Yep, yeah, those connections are all identified. 
So in terms of next steps, as I start, stated at the outset, we've got to wrap up chapter four and five um, and get those out and into the plan for review. And then we're gonna come back to the December meeting and present this again as a final. Um, and then I believe we're looking at January adoption, correct? Yeah. Okay. So with the, the paths that uh, would go north to south, um, you know, we've got a lot of hills and so uh, rain, rainwater, um, you know, so, are you thinking about any kind of like anything about that? So there's a, a certain level of site design that when a trail come, goes beyond sort of conceptualizing its location, we take into consideration that the grading of the trail, the design, the stormwater management, those sorts of things. Um, the plan states clearly stormwater management, natural resource management is really important. Um, it is identified as something that should be looked at anytime new facilities are developed, but it's not something that we look at specifically at this level of planning because we don't know yet where a trail is going to go through and what the specific conditions are that that trail will encounter and how those can be addressed. So it's handled more as a generalization, um, as in, in something that we encourage, and then it's left to or encourage that design team that starts to plan that trail in earnest would address as part of that. Okay, address maybe or recommend building materials for those paths? Yeah, I would say that with few exceptions if we're recommending for a paved trail it's concrete um, asphalt is not as high performing although sometimes it's got lower upfront cost uh, soft surface trails generally in an urban environment create a whole lot of issues uh, that we wouldn't uh, want to introduce and then where soft surface trails are being recommended hiking trails and so forth within natural areas you know those are naturally graded it's basically uncovering the native soil and then benching that trail to appropriately handle the stormwater and navigate the topography. It's gotten urban trails in particular really simple to address from a design standpoint because concrete is the most high performing of materials that you can put down um, and it generally is the most cost effective over the long run. Other questions that I can answer for you at this time? We'll be able to go back the different parts at the end, or do you want to go through them as you brought them up here? I, I can certainly go to, well, sir. are there specific questions that you have? Peterson on? Park, you kind of got lucky, I was going to ask on it and you pulled it out. <clears throat> Let's see what I can get you to. I know when you pulled up your, or right before this, your 10 year plan and the parks listing on there, I know this part didn't make it. Um, I'm gonna particularly take uh, interest in this part because okay. I personally believe it's terribly underused for the park that it is and being on Central Park, as much traffic that, that does drive by that. And as I don't know if it goes into how many homes lived around it or it gets used and I couldn't see your recommendations or what you uh, thought the potential improvements are. I don't really see. Yeah, that, it's, it's got a placeholder that says to be determined. Okay, because like one thing I think it hurts, for example, at this part is it has a baseball field, right. but it has no fence. The reason I feel this park wouldn't get the baseball play is that Emites Park is like five, uh, like a five minute drive away being a past president of Emise Park, that's where the baseball play is gonna go. Sure. It's surely not gonna go to a, a baseball park that has no fence in the right. outfield. One thing that deters kids for playing baseball is when they hit the ball, they gotta run an, an extra two blocks, go get the ball. Right. Not that so they could hit it that far or if they can. So <laughs> my hope would be that for this particular park, I will try to get the baseball part taken out. Yep and utilize that part of the um, park to whatever you guys uh, recommend to um, take that place because it's not getting enough use 
for the amount of traffic that uh, travels by it every single day okay. and the amount of kids that are there. And if I have to use some of, uh, I'm fortunate to be in a position next year that if I have to use some beautification money or push other people, Peterson Park is just to me grossly underused for, for the potential that it has. Now, sure. every park is, is important and I'm not, yeah. but I, I, I really want to see Peterson Park. It didn't make that list. I don't know if that list is final on the 10 year plan. That That's not the 10, that was just a sort of a summary of recommendations for okay. parks. So the 10 year plan will be included and in all parks will be looked at okay. where it falls on that list is to be determined. Okay, yep. I, just, I just hope maybe if we reconsider Taking out the baseball because there's sure. uh, Emice Park so close by that I think Peterson Park could have a little bit more potential, a little bit more use. Like for example, you know why it says it has like a shelter. Yeah. <laughs> Once one family takes it, that shelter, that area right. is done. There's no, you know, to me, two families really can't use that shelter. I don't know what those cost or you know, and that's something sure. that I could talk to Chad about. But I just feel this park is very under underutilized and I think if you take like for example the baseball field out put something else there that this this park could get used a lot more so okay. I appreciate that there were some mentionings of uh, natural resources or natural areas mm -hmm. is the term that was used um, I was wondering if that is defined in, in the document or where that definition the natural resource area, I don't think we specifically have a definition in the document yet, um, but we can certainly we can certainly add that and we were really looking at parks that have, we look at it from the perspective of improved parks and unimproved parks. So an unimproved park area is generally a stand of woodland um, or similar type area in a park that doesn't have uh, mown grass, paving, amenities. So there's Woodland at Marquette Dog Park, for example. Um, there's areas at Credit Island that we would consider unimproved, those sorts of areas that are Woodland. Make sense? Sounds like a dangerous definition. It could be. Yeah. yeah. Krista, we see that you have a comment. Would you uh, care to share it now? Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to mention uh, grass concrete. Um, I know that sounds a little silly, but it's pretty big and up and coming in areas with uh, storm drainage issues. Um, and it's actually really pretty and uh, it blends in with uh, landscaping quite well. And I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Patrick? Ask, ask her about it. I don't know. Yeah. Chris, I'm not sure I'm following the comment. Yeah. Um, grass concrete, uh, it's where they implement uh, living plants into a sloped landscape that leads into a waterway such as the Mississippi. Um, and uh, they do it in major storm areas and are implement uh, it, it, uh, for water retention, um, it's better and you'll see better results. Okay. I just wanted to add that. I'm where you're coming from. Could you go back to the preceding slide that showed some other overview of Peters of Park? One moment. Not to make it difficult. Um, there was another photo group there. Adriana, there is the the water natural thing that's in Peterson Park. I evaluated I that. Yeah, it it is involved with if you if you see there's a heavy incline. You saw a permeable park area. The street is water permeable and it was redone for that. And then there's a very steep block. And so it collects there's a place to collect you know the runoff and you'll see that it does have um, perennials and those kind of things within it. So that's that's the only place that I remember seeing in that park, but at least it was addressed at a certain level. And then if you go up to the the slide of go back to the other slide that we had on there. Yeah. Do you see right there the car? 
that was purposely that that area was redone with the permeable Pavement. Pavement in that area. So that kind of, I think, answers some of the question that we were posing. How I know that it's one of the ones I was assigned to evaluate, yeah. but I wanted to let you know that I was up close and personal with that. <laughs> so you know, as deep roots were. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Other questions, right? Yeah, please. Yeah. So I guess that that definition of natural areas does concern me. Um, is there a way that we can maybe talk about the defining that? Absolutely. In the document? Yep. Do so. you have a specific recommendation based on your experience here in town that you'd like us to to tie this to, or would you like us to propose and then you provide feedback? Um, actually, we do have in the audience uh, Bob Bryant. He's my botanical. Bob the botanist, my plant mentor, uh, helps teach me uh, plant identification and things, but he also has uh, extensive backgrounds in parks and park management and natural areas management. Um, so as far as the definition of natural areas, I think Bob um, could like, have something. Well, as far as the biology standpoint, the natural area is the original vegetation that was there at the time itself. Mm -hmm. And you, and then when they, you now hear a lot of the, they call restoration. If you go out there and say, the plant of prairie on the case of bare ground, then they call it restoration. It's not a restoration, it's a planting. Sure. And so and that's one thing I've actually inventoried, totally inventoried Credit Island. Uh, a gentleman named Ludwig Golder did a basket plant for Scott and Clinton. I mean, Scott and Muscatine County back in 1960 when he completed that. It took him 30 years to do it. And so I have re, uh, done the inventory on credit I'm and I actually have a PowerPoint program on it. Uh, this was done several years ago for uh, uh, Brian Smith when he was the uh, charge of public works. Okay. And, uh, and so, Compared the two, I found things that he didn't identify things there, but that's what you got to look at. And basically, the biggest threat to our natural areas here is the uh, threat of invasive species. Right? In reality, the invasive species are not the major threat. The major threat is us knowing we have a problem and not doing anything about it. And basically, many of the parks, both county, city and state are ecological disasters or disasters waiting to happen. And I'm as guilty as any of them. But I, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, ever Eaton Valley Refuge up in Jackson, Jackson County, but the Clinton County Park. Uh, that was our nature center. I'm the one who developed the Watson River and by much education center and I've been heavily involved with uh, uh, Nayant Marsh. Yep. And so I've been involved with technically three centers. Uh, I'm a member of the Iowa Association of the Natural, so I was a founding member of that. And I am involved with many of the conservation groups around here. I know much about any of the native stuff here, probably anybody does. Sure. And I have identified over 50 some threatened and endangered species myself. Okay. So that's one thing to me has been really that's put on the back burner is taking care of our natural areas. I can interject just for the sake of time. I appreciate Bob's comments, but the purpose of the master plan, that, that speaks more to a natural resources plan than a park plan. Uh, I mean, I get we want to define and look at invasive species, but we have not passed confluence with that level that this is in a natural resources. Right, I just was curious about defining the term yeah, natural I mean, areas. I, sure, just for the sake of Patrick's time, this this particular topic, I think, is able to have that. Oh, okay. No, I understand. Yeah. The, the, the point, though, is, is well taken that, you know, for the casual reader and even the educated reader, it's important that, that we clearly define what we are determining as a natural area so that it can be within a park. park. Yeah, within a park, exactly. Thank you. Other questions? I just want to make a comment that 
when we started talking about branding of our parks, I think that's the best idea I've heard so far. It is. It's a great, great thing because large companies have brands. Yeah, I, I liked that idea as well. Um, I would also like to know, you know, different neighborhoods have different characteristics and things like that as well. So maybe keeping both of those things in mind. Yeah, I would say that generally speaking, when we're thinking about branding in terms of the park system, we're not overtly discouraging a neighborhood from interjecting into the brand conversation. But our goal typically is to reinforce that brand throughout the community. And that neighborhood branding happens at a different scale and in a different location. So if we want to, to really reinforce the brand across the city of Davenport, we need to be consistent from neighborhood to neighborhood. <coughs> May I ask a question? It's a light bulb here. Um, we now have a branding of the city of Davenport connected to Park and Rec. So, how does that come into the recommendations for branding with parks? Right. So, it's, it's a great question. You'll see that we just very high level, we took the, the color system and the iconography and, and typeface of the city's brand and incorporated into the document as a starting place. Whether or not that carries consistently across discussions of signage and architecture and color on site furnishings and those sorts of things is part of the discussion that occurs during a branding process. But minimally, I would think that from a signage perspective that, that city brand is represented you know, as a logo on the sign at the minimum basic level, and then whether or not it in, informs the form factor of the sign or the, the other colors on the sign is something that you determine when you go through that process. And one of the ways that, you know, we recommend that you start to establish that is by developing a brand guide, or standards guide for the brand within the system that would address signage, that addresses standardizing your site furnishing selections, your shelter selections, mm -hmm. defining an architectural style that when you have, say, a restroom, for example, that doesn't come as a pre-manufactured piece, that we've established a, a design standard for that that can be implemented in numerous locations to continue to reinforce that idea. So Chad could speak to this, but City of Iowa City did something very similar. Um, a few years ago, and we had, I think, two standard, like it was a modern shelter type and there's a more traditional shelter type. Um, and then, you know, depending on the neighborhood and the quality and level of the park, that, that particular feature was included that way. If I can just make a comment. Uh, one, Wendy, actually, Becca, Zach, and I are working on the sign branding package yeah, right now as a separate piece. So that will be coming down the road. Awesome. But I also wanted to say, as Patrick mentioned earlier, as a result of not having a comprehensive master plan through all these years, what he alluded to that just when you take a sign away from the park, the different the different types of shelters, fixtures are scattered throughout the system, right? There's no connection. Um, so that's why. And that's a result of not having a guiding document through the years. And it's just sort of, we need this here, or we need this there. And an alderman prioritizes something or funds it or something, you know, and you sort of just piecemeal stuff together. So one of the major goals of having this document is help guide those processes moving forward for us. So first on my list would sense. be the, the wooden sign at Chummy Park. <laughs> I, in, yeah. To this discussion, yeah. I do want to add the caveat um, that for your signature parks, it's okay to deviate from a brand standard because there's a you're creating a district and a destination that is desirable to be different and unique. There are certain elements that can be consistent from one to the other, but um, you know, for the the highest quality, most visible parks, it's okay to deviate from that brand provided you've well established it throughout the rest of the system. 
Okay, so you know you can sit here and think, well, the riverfront parks are going to be different because they're in sort of their own district, perhaps. Um, I'm not trying to discourage that and say, no, no, you got to rethink the branding in those areas. It's perfectly appropriate to create a unique environment with those types of parks. Awesome. We have to wait and see, but it would be good to have some uniformity. I totally yeah. agree. And it makes it easier for us. Like when we go to replace a shelter, having three options that they consider, and then working with the neighborhood and saying, okay, just from a budgeting standpoint, lining up costs, and all that sort of stuff. That, yeah. You can also purchase it volume. Yeah. And from a maintenance level. You know, yeah. We're not dealing with different manufacturers, different vendors, different equipment. I could pick one playground company that could do it all for us. Where do we expect that? You know, even with the playgrounds, the group, the residents who are using it are asked to reflect and comment and they're quite unique when you look at the equipment. And that's, we don't want that to go away. Right. Well, isn't it always changing? So you need to keep looking at the modern times of what's going to happen. I think I mentioned this once before. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, my comment regarding the singular playground company is not meant to dissuade variety or mm -hmm. uniqueness. It's mm -hmm. when we deal with seven different ones, they have different parts and different things, and you have maintenance issues. It, you know, the challenge is just to keep things readily available and get supplies to make repairs. I think we're going in the right direction. Yeah. Other final comments from uh, members of the group here, the advisory committee. Right. Yourself, are we yeah, moving on? I or? appreciate the feedback. Yeah, we've well, got work to do. We can get back at it tomorrow and get this thing turned around. Well, I'm I'm just astounded. Now I know where the <laughs> appendix is large. We all figured that out. But this is just going to be awesome to see this because many of us who have been part of the advisory board over time have with different directors, you know, been challenged to go out and do some evaluation. So we've all come with different perspectives of seeing some of these. So it'll be fun to see how it all comes together. It'll be great. So as I mentioned before, um, the intent is hopefully get to a more complete version of the draft in the coming weeks. When Patrick comes back in December, that'll be the opportunity really to deep dive more into the recommendations of the implementation portion of the plan and, and talk to that. In the meantime, if, if you have questions, comments, send them to me or Jessica. We'll make sure we get them routed to Patrick uh, so he can have them ready for what Could he we potentially done. get a hard copy of that? Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. It won't just be. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we can print some I'll copies for you guys. Yeah. You can mail it to <laughs> me personally. I like the hard copy. Yeah, it's I much easier for me to too much sort through it with right. than look at it on a screen. Well, so don't have to do it. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll buy some reads. <laughs> Early in your presentation, you mentioned soft tissues. Yep. Tell me what you're talking about. So, Pros Consulting, who's a sub consultant to us in this project, is a national firm based in the Indianapolis area that evaluates recreation facilities, park systems, provides benchmarking analysis, really looks at sort of operations and maintenance and programming within um, park systems and the associated amenities like golf courses. And so they came out and interviewed staff, evaluated the facilities, uh, for the, the golf courses, the city on golf courses, and provided an entire separate set of recommendations for the operations maintenance and physical improvements in those courses that are included as a part of the appendix on this. It's golf is a nationally is one of the highest trending activities currently and there's a general sense within the community that golf courses need more attention or they need to go away right and city ownership of golf courses um, has always been challenging. It, don't, it doesn't really matter what municipality you are, what parks agency you are, owning the golf course and managing golf operations is always going to be a challenge because it's um, it, it's expensive, it's maintenance intense, requires a lot of resources. 
some communities do better at it than others. And so the purpose of our evaluation was to determine where the city of Davenport is sitting with respect to the golf courses and to make some recommendations about how those can be improved. So those are all included. Cool. And correct me, but I believe is Phil going to be here with you potentially? Pros Phil or Leon will yeah. be here in the So Jerry Pros, the sub consultant that Patrick mentioned, one of their uh, members will be here. So at the December, the river's edge of the call, we can deep dive into Yeah, and I, 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 and I think if you want to spend time focused more on those two facilities, River's Edge and the golf courses, then I'd have Leon come. Um, if you want to do more of a deep dive into the benchmarking and the program assessment than I'd have Phil come um, because they kind of divvied the work up between the two of them. I can, you know, I mean, we can certainly also, Jerry or anybody else who's interested in golf for River's Edge, I could probably hook up with Leon separately on a Zoom yeah. meeting and we could just deep dive into those mm -hmm. documents too. Because uh, I think, I think the benchmarking and demographic trends analysis, program analysis that Phil did is, is much more comprehensive to the community. You know, not that we love golf, but you know, uh, I'd probably rather see more time spent on that with this group. And then anybody interested in those two specialized areas, we can I can coordinate an additional meeting with Leon that he can walk us through those reports. I think that'd be fine. I'd be excited about that. <laughs> I think we're a very curious group, if you can tell. It's great. Yeah. It's fantastic. And so we'll have things to read and um, to be ready for the December. Christy, yes. Christy has one more question. Oh, Krista. Hello. Hey. I one last question. Um, I know we were talking earlier about uh, natural resources. And I was curious whether observation areas fell into parks or if that was considered natural resources as well. Yeah, what do you mean by an observation area? Um, for um, uh, like displaced animals go to Credit Island. I've started to realize humans as well. It's kind of um, the wild place. And sure. um, I've noticed so many beautiful birds and so many people go there to observe our birds on the Mississippi River. Um, and I was curious, other than um, other than near the uh, the landfill, uh, which was a DNR project, I was curious um, if we had any future plans for observation areas in our future. It's an excellent question. I, I can't speak to that. It's not something that uh, has been really brought up, so it's certainly worth exploring. I'm assuming you're talking some sort of formal observation area or designated areas rather than just general observation getting that right. Yeah, I realize that the skeleton of Park and Rec is really education and it's it's outreach programs. And um, I'm curious uh, what that holds in the future for our parks, especially areas like Credit Island. That's it. It's good. It's a good question. Yeah. I think it's like. I think there's a lot more that could be done at Credit Island, so it'd be interesting to see what your your suggestions are. Chad and I've talked a little bit about some of our thoughts on Credit Island, and they are included in the draft that you'll, you'll see. But I mean, if I can speak <clears throat> candidly, you know, generally speaking, our current recommendation is to return Credit Island as much as possible to an unimproved area to remove the sort of remnants of the golf course, and the ball fields, and those sorts of things that were more programmed activities and start thinking more strategically about how you restore that area to a more resilient, naturalized landscape. Did you hear that, Krista? Yes, yes, I did. Um, I see, uh, because I, you know, I live in this area, I see a lot of wildlife in the middle of the city, surprisingly, that, um, I didn't think I'd find. And I noticed that a lot of the downed mulberry trees, et cetera, are now um, 
a home to these displaced animals that I found. So I did feel like mentioning that because we are uh, just as them natural resources. Thank you for bringing that up. Are we uh, ready to move on? Are we good with that, Patrick? Are you comfortable? With Very comfortable. Are? I appreciate all the feedback and, and your patience and waiting for this plan to be delivered. Great. Great uh, before you go on, uh, I'll just like to say, being the park person, I, I very much appreciate this program you did. Thank I you. understood what you were talking about. <laughs> that makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. good. Well, we'll move on then because um, uh, our next agenda item is a uh, staff report and uh, Chad, verbal report. Are you going to? Yeah, I don't really talk about but, uh, the majority of you know the report is in the packet from staff. We intended really to take both of this meeting to go over the master plan. A um, couple things. Um, to note uh, that will be coming up potentially with council cycle in, in reference to um, the parks department. Um, many of you may have known or knew Jim Paisley, the longtime golf pro at EMICE and one of our founding members of the first team program at Red Hawk. He passed away unexpectedly back in May. Uh, Jim served as the head professional from 1971 to 2000, I believe, one uh, for the city of Danforth. The first tee, he was instrumental in, in bringing that chapter here and to Red Hawk. And the first tee board um, went uh, this past Tuesday at their board meeting, took action to ask the city to consider renaming the classroom in the Red Hawk clubhouse in Jim's honor. So I mentioned at the council I'm working on a resolution so you may see that come forward here in the next cycle <laughs> so it's just more of an FYI that uh, we are looking into honoring Jim and his garden. His son Matt is our current golf pro at uh, Duck Creek. Uh, we, this plan is uh, like I said it's coming along. Um, we are blessed and cursed to be swamped with uh, a lot of projects. I made reference to the ARPA funding that the city received and many of the park improvements that are coming forward with that. So Betsy and I and several of the administrative teams in, in the offices have, have been busy at work issuing RFPs and RFQs for various projects. Um, that will also be, I talked to Patrick about making sure those are referenced in the plan. So I have to get into some information on that. Um, other than that, uh, vegetarian lights, we are going to do, I think you all got the invite for next Tuesday after the council meeting. If you haven't seen the show, come see the show. It's, this is our third year, correct? Yep. Yeah. Uh, third year of doing the holiday lights at Vegetary. Uh, so we always do sort of a preview VIP for you guys at council uh, the, uh, following the uh, meeting prior to Thanksgiving. So that's next Tuesday. Uh, and I, I mentioned that that guy and, and Zach Peterson, who's our landscape architect and public works, are working on a branding initiative with our signage. Um, as Wendy alluded to, the city underwent a citywide branding rebranding initiative, hence uh, the new logo that you have seen and we've been using uh, over the last year. Um, but we are probably the largest forward-facing city I identity in the community with all our parks and our signage. And you'll see in all these assessment sheets and when they, you see all our different park signs, you'll just be blown away at the diversity and difference in all of them. So uh, we feel it's pretty important to get some funding in place and get a, uh, a signage package put together and start to rebrand and redo our signs in, in our parks. So uh, the team is working on that. I also want to give kudos to Jessica and Becca and Daniel and, and several other of the staff. We won best department uh, in the Halloween parade. Yeah, um, so great. if you attended, Parks and Rec did a good job uh, again. So we plan on keeping that trophy and <laughs> rubbing it in the fire department's face <laughs> every chance we can get uh, because they are obnoxious about that competition. And although we love them, uh, we enjoy meeting them. 
think the best department in Hollywood. So kudos to the team on that. And I will stop talking there and let you, if you have questions for Teresa, Troy, or uh, Betsy or Becca, um, I'll let you guys at it. Or if you have questions for me before I step off, Adriana. Um, you mentioned um, some some additional funding, maybe. Uh, I was wondering if we might be considering allocating funds to Curd Island for the causeway, that whole discussion we were talking about. Yeah, so um, in terms of the bridge, yeah. we talked about that. Okay. Um, no, there is no, so the back step a little bit, the ARPA I'm referring to is the American Rescue Act by Congress that gave millions of dollars for infrastructure and community improvements for communities. So the city of Davenport, we received roughly a little over $40 million. So uh, when that was allocated or awarded or that came out, the city issued just a broad sort of survey to the community that maybe may or may not have seen just sort of seeking input. Um, that funding through that process has all been allocated. So it, ARPA can't, won't be considered. But I will say that it, one of the current proposed projects uh, relating to the causeway, and it will be reviewed in this fiscal year CIP plan, is a, a hydrology study to see the flow between the slough and the causeway. That's sort of the first step and then determining you know, the bridge or what the next steps would be. So, and it was identified in the flood resiliency plan that the, the city just undertook. <laughs> So yes, everything it's in the works. Is there funding for a bridge at this point? No, but at least they're starting that process to get that ball rolling. So but there it's could been potentially be funding just because it is uh, one issue, and it, you know, like grants or something. Yeah, right. Just yeah. it just depends on what comes up with federal money. Basically. Yeah, yeah, and and I know this city public works has had other conversations with the board of engineers. Um, and then, of course, riverfront improvements and heavily involved in the River West plan and other things. So it's been identified as a high need. It's just trying to get that funding for it. What kind of time frame would the hydrology study be over? So it's proposed. It's not necessarily funded at this point. So if you remember when I talk budget, when I do my presentation, the process, the first year of the five year CIP plan is the funded year. So this is just being introduced. So we're in our process now. So council reviews that in January at their budget workshop meetings and prioritizes and determines where in that five-year plan various projects will be. Right now it's lined up for fiscal year 23, which is the first year. So if it stays there, if it gets prioritized, then as of July 1, that money will be available to start that process. And then my last question on the uh, in this report here, I mentioned uh, American are partnering with Urban Lands to plant hundreds of acorn trees. Uh, wherever those are going to be. That's a Teresa question. They were, I'm sorry, I had no voice. <laughs> they were up by Prairie Heights. They worked with Urban Lands and Waters in their tree farm here. Okay. Kind of like uh, there's like a barn they use that kind of identifies it. So Prairie Heights Park, Living Land and Water has an actual tree farm in the park. Okay. Where we've dedicated many, many years to what's been established. Yeah, for they quite well. five, um, So the AmeriCorps team helped seven, them help them reestablish some of their trees. And then they use those trees in their projects when they go around and do their restoration and the critter cleanup stuff. So. Hey, Jeff, just yes, sir. Quick. Not holding to a number. You're talking about signage throughout the park, yep. like mall. Is there a number that just is being thrown around to do that? Because when I look at and as you know how tight budgets are and how getting money for certain things is going to be really tough. Out of the ARPA money, none was set us, or at least I didn't see anything. Just looking through what you guys have planned for the two and point five million. That for signage, signage yeah, no. is that like. Yeah. Just roughly, what's the number? That so what, what we've done as a placeholder, the, the currently proposed CIP plan is thirty thousand dollars annually over the next five years. So to phase it in, okay. um, we'll have better idea 
once Rebecca and I and Zach sort of complete, bring that that design package forward because that'll have the estimated cost per sign. Um, but we're thinking, at least from preliminary, the phase strategy would be to do community and regional parks first with the first couple of years of funding and then trickle it down into the neighborhood parks. It's not going to be a lump sum of, you know, two or three hundred thousand dollars and we're just going to do all the signs of one year because so I just don't think that'll make it in the CIP. We, we've taken a more strategic approach to try to phase these in a few years so that sticker price isn't shocking to council. So, but uh, I think our hope would be in the first year to handle the majority of our community parks and then go on with them. So, but it'll be in the CIP. Other questions? I have, I have a comment. Um, well, kind of question, not really a question, comment. Um, two days ago, I drove through Credit Island. I challenged the rest of the board to do that. I was shocked at the number of dead trees. However, yesterday and today, the city crews have started cutting trees down. But it is, it looks like a ghost town. It really, really that park has really been neglected the trees have been neglected and you can't drive five feet without seeing two or three trees yeah. that are dead it is so I'll, I'll comment on that um, just as a reference forestry is part of public works um, the parks and rec department so the direct show and flooding and everything unfortunately that division is probably not staffed to handle the capacity of the disasters and the tree work they need to do. Um, they've reached out to private contracting companies and they're still backlogged with directional work. So the we identified, I mean, we're fully aware of all the trees and issues and that's why you're starting to see the removal of the work. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a product of neglect or uh, those dead trees are a result of flood and standing water right but just the fact that they're still standing right just, no we recognize that it, it, it unfortunately it's just a product of workload and the capacity of the forestry crews out of public works yeah. but Betsy's been working diligently with John Vance to um yeah they, they right. had they probably had maybe 20 or so trees already cut down right so and we really targeted hard. to be winter work for them sure because this is the good time so they'll be doing that over the next two to three months Right. Alderman Dunn has been all over it. <laughs> so. Yeah, I just, it just yeah. for myself, being yeah. in that area, I just drove through because yeah. I knew we were having this meeting. It's like, I wanted to see. And if you, if, yeah, you yeah. hear 130 and you think, ah, no big deal. But when you drive through, it's shocking. Yeah. Well, realistically, it's shocking at how many yeah. that, I mean, that are dead. Unfortunately, the island, as we're all aware, has really taken. A toll sure. to flooding in the yeah. recent years. Not only the tree issues, but the sand deposits. You know, we were underwater 60 plus days right. in 2019. So I think a lot of the recommendations too you're going to see coming forward from Confluence, you know, restoring what we can to a natural sort of habitat and then balancing still recreational amenities with activities because the River West plan also identifies the need to draw people to the island. So there, there needs to be some level of family activity, whether it's in the form of playgrounds um, or um, right. you know, soft trails potentially or yeah. other dog park. I don't know. But even, even the mowing, because it seems like it's mold and it's, I don't know how far, but then there's the real talk of grass. Yeah, you and, know, and that's done purposely to maintain a natural more element. I mean, we we may we mow in general a, a 20 foot width along the roadway yeah. around, but we don't have the equipment or the personnel to I manicure see. the interior of the island. So. Those are those are good comments, and I'm also looking at the clock. Yeah. Are you okay that we move on to looking at the Advisory reports. I thought you were going to. Oh, I was just curious um, as to if, uh, regarding February, um, were, were we um, still planning, or is there currently any like environmental education programming going on there? Yep. There yep. Is... We still run it. Okay. The learning center's 
seasonal though. It's not operational currently, like as of today, we close it down for the season, but we still do uh, environmental education programming out of the Lincoln Center as well as at Vancouver. And we're actually, we that's one of the challenges that you see often from our team is the staffing issues. And that's one position that we're actually currently reevaluating and trying to find a way to make it a full-time position um, because we've had significant turnover or frequent turnover in that position in our environmental education board. I also saw, um, I was looking over some notes in May and it was kind of a similar situation with the horticulture position with uh, Mandy Beard. Has that been filled? That position yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, we filled that one. Okay. And this one, what we're looking at, it'll be sort of a joint facility programmer position. So it'll have programming duties, but it'll also have a a uh, lend some labor and maintenance uh, aspect to the whole team. Okay. So it's, it, we're trying to sort of combine that. Moving on to other staff reports, if there are questions. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. oh yeah, sure. Um, you have um, park operations, recreation, <clears throat> revenue facilities, and challenges. Were there things that you wanted to ask of our staff that's here in regard to those reports? Yeah, you know. I mean, I guess I'll I mention every meeting, it seems like now. What's happening with Tyler Park Playground that's <laughs> back closed again? Yeah, I asked Betsy that as I, before the meeting started. <laughs> so uh, we, upon uh, installation, um, we were getting some calls about kids accessing the roof of the top. So Tom Franks, who is our uh, certified playground instructor, did a deeper dive and look and we found some significant installation problems. So we are working with the playground manufacturer, the vendor who installed it to resolve this. Like, I'm pretty sure I know like the part at the top where you can like squeeze through. Yeah. And then so, at the top, so there's so not caps on all the pipes. It's like they didn't install the very top. That's just the surface of the issues, there's more. So we've essentially deemed it a safety concern and at this point, uh, we've fenced it off until the vendor can get back out here and resolve those issues. Uh, but last I know, the vendor is going through some health issues. So unfortunately, we're in limbo at this point, which is, I'm sure not the answer I want to give you all, but that is the reality. And being a person that was there and asked a young lady who came through there, uh, that's not what it's for, get out, yeah. you know, so it, totally it right. is an issue, yeah. The one fortunate thing is we haven't ripped out the old playground that's on the top of the hill, so that is still useful for the kids until we resolve the whole issues. Other questions? Jerry, you had your hand. Yeah. Just a couple things. I, I see in here that the Special Olympic equipment is going getting bad. Are we going to get some more new stuff? That will be in your park development. Okay, good. Program for you guys to prioritize. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Put it on there. Let's get it done. Yeah. <laughs> and then, secondly, staffing. They bring us up all the time, and here we are through the winter. And we're going to come up and start the spring again, and we're going to be short people for the swimming pools, uh, golf courses, uh, parks area, and so forth. So here we are a few months ahead of time. So what are we doing? So we continue to have conversation. What can we do? Yeah. What can you guys do? Or what? Or, yeah. Okay. What can, what can we do too? As well. well, certainly. So the biggest issue is. I see it as probably our pay scale, to be honest, in terms of again. trying to attract <laughs> and retain qualified individuals for our season. As you guys all know, our parks operation is largely a seasonal operation, so we hire part-time and seasonal staff. We don't have the full-time employees such as Public Works has. Um, So we continue to work with HR. We continue to have conversations with our finance. Now they have to be 18, budget. at least 18, correct? Well, for certain positions, they can work with work permits. Yeah, like six kids. Yeah. 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 
our lifeguards, the majority of our lifeguards are generally high school or college age kids. They used to have, a long time ago, they used to have kids, they could work and have a job, and that was part of their class. Yeah. Years and years I don't know if there's ago. vocational do they education do that in the high schools or not. Yeah, I have some of those programs. I actually did just see in, um, sorry, I'm a and our PA um, was highlighting something that they did in Utah, I think, that the high school offered um, gym credit for taking the lifeguard class. So I was looking to pursue that. Uh, um, to see well, that I know it used to work years like ago. I never got involved in it. And I, I would tell you this isn't just an issue specific to us, it's oh, no. a nationwide. Mm -hmm. Our HR department, bless their soul, for <clears throat> recruiting, recruiting, recruiting the best they can. But when we don't have applications, and it's largely, I think, because of our, our big scale. So we're working to try to convince through our budgeting process and our finance department. We need, but you guys, as appointees to council members, what by all means. I mean, obviously, I think the point that I would make to my council person is the parks department is uniquely hit by the pay scale because fire department and police department and public works don't have too many people making $11 an hour. So their pay problems are different than the like, quick stars paying 15. How do we get a mower for 12? Some of our lowest rates start at eight. Yeah, I didn't want to want to say eight, but yeah, I don't know how we get anybody for eight to be honest to do anything. Sure. But, and I understand we got the new building going up out of the RA mines, uh, the repair building. Yep. The okay. building out there. It's going. That's good. Yep. That's almost done. Other things that we need to talk about. Other questions? We ready to move on. We do have, um, yes, as uh, I'm asking now, uh, Chris. Do you have a riverfront? Yeah, I'll keep, it, report? I'll keep it short. Uh, they spent much of the meeting talking about the flood resiliency plan. You can kind of see the media reports on that. They're still pretty focused on the Riverfront Improvement Commission's land and assets protecting them. Um, they also talked about there being a new channel cat. They're replacing the channel cat dock at Lower Lindsay Park in the upcoming years, hopefully, making a deal with Metrolink to do that because it's pretty old and rickety it sounds like um and then an interesting thing that steve aarons talked about at the end was a uh, like kind of a new app or website they can print out these qr codes and place them around the riverfront and then someone can come up and scan them and it'll actually load up into like a bot where they can say what's playing at the band shell this week and it will be able to answer that without a human typing back to them or what, what's a map of of LeClaire Park and they'll get them the information they need. Uh, I mean, not obviously also be programmed ahead of time, but that seems like a really neat thing that could spread beyond the riverfront, uh, not to steal their idea, but um, the idea to go to any park and ask about programming automatically yeah. and just get answers from, you know, via text, seemed pretty exciting to me. Is that in process? Um, like, is there a Steve was going to start working on it. It was pretty okay. cheap. Uh, it's just like a company that does it. And I mean, I think they just provide kind of the software back end that does the like chatting part. And obviously the city or Steve or Riverfront Improvement Commission would have to provide all the information. And then actually the city itself even provides the stickers or however we want to get those QR codes out in the world. But you, you, it's called Hello Lamppost, I think is the company name, because the idea is you'd have these QR codes just on street lights, street lamps down along the river, and anybody could scan it and ask whatever questions they had, kind of like an ambassador that doesn't cost anything. So it, it was kind of a one-off thing at the end of the meeting, but I was really excited by it. It kind of automatically connects with our thoughts today on marketing and, and coordination, and here it is. Front commission doing something that also impacts us and this first time I've heard. So, um, I mean, it was, I it was yeah. I wrote it down. I already saw it. Okay. Down, so I'm well, sure good. she's quite not following up on it. Because we have had over time all of that trying to connect, and then there was you need to have the uniform signs for everything, and and then if 
if one person was and it wasn't part of a business partners would be upset if someone else was being promoted so there's this kind of conflict position kind of thing so i'm interested in seeing what's going on with that but i do i mean we haven't that was october's meeting so he might have an update on the next whatever it is the november meeting thank you for that yep. are we able to move on other questions we certainly welcome those i think we've done advisory <laughs> advisory time kind of throughout the evening is there something specific in advisory time <laughs> that we need to discuss are we good to move on to a motion to adjourn Motion Is there a second? That was quick. <laughs> so, so we'll Next month, we will be back in the council chambers um, with the presentation. Um, you may want to schedule a little more time. I, we're not going to fit into an hour. Oh, no. So, um, Yes. Thank you. I think there was a unanimous yes. And I'm going to write yes. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Krista. Bye, Krista. Bye, Krista. Bye, Krista.